What's up, everyone? Welcome to another Serious Angler podcast here on this awesome Friday morning. And it is presented, as always, by X2 Power and our friends over there. And today we have an awesome episode. We have Bryant Smith coming on, who is a touring National Professional Fishing League pro who just qualified for the Elite Series, which I am assuming it is a childhood lifelong dream for him. So we're going to dive into that um, quite deeply here and what is going to go on with him in the next few months. But um, one thing, a couple housekeeping notes. One thing I want to mention is tomorrow morning as you're listening to this, there will be a new episode of the Lure Lab launching at 6 a.m. So you can join and view that on your drive to the boat launch if you're fishing or view it at any time at your pleasure. And we're going to be talking about finesse swim baiting, which is a really cool episode. It's about 20 minutes long. Um, other housekeeping notes, Deacon will have an episode Monday. I'm not sure what it is. I know he's been recording since he got home from his second place finish up in Idaho at Crew de Lane. And congrats to him on that again at the ABA um, I believe the ABA Bass Championship Team Trail for the regional, I believe, was the tournament he fished. And then, um, yeah, that's about it for housekeeping here. Be on the lookout for the announcement for next week's Tuesday Night Live. But without further ado, let's get Bryant on here and talk about Lake Hartwell and what he has going on. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great. I appreciate uh, you having me back on. Yeah, it's good to have you back here again. We get you twice in a year. That's um almost like a rarity over here on the, the podcast channel. So it's good to have you back. So what's I, new since the last time we had you? Oh man, it's been a uh it's been quite the whirlwind, you know, a few tournaments here, um uh, a few babies there, you know, just a few. Uh, I thought it was just one. <laughs> yeah, just one. But <laughs> man, when he cries, he feels like a handful of them. Oh, I I miss, but don't miss those days. So it was it was a big learning curve to uh, figure out how he wanted to be dealt with and all that good stuff. But uh, you know, wouldn't trade him for the world. He's been uh, absolutely amazing. You no, know you should do is ask Bucking Bass, Bucking Bass, to come up with like some hardcore baby raps to like swaddle him in. Oh, yeah, and he would love them too. Because <laughs> I mean, that is <laughs> that is his favorite thing in the world when he gets swaddled. Uh, oh. It's it's awesome. It's it's the, it's about the only way either feed him or swaddle him that we can get him to uh, <laughs> calm down a little bit. So. I, I remember those days completely. My daughter, who is now three, I don't think she liked to be swaddled very much because uh, we put <laughs> her down for an apple. She was swaddled and she'd rip her arms out and then scream. So she's <laughs> like, what is going they on? They don't understand. They don't understand. Yeah. Like you, you like being swaddled, but you fight it to get your arms out the whole time. I don't yeah. get it. <laughs> yeah. They're, they, uh, the way they process things like, if I could only remember when I was that young, like how they're processing information, it has mm -hmm. to be insane the way that brain works at that oh, age. Yeah. It's a lot so, of stimulus going on. Oh, for sure. So how are you handling the newborn now that you're home? He's like, what, a month or two old now? Are you getting any yeah. sleep now that you've get, gotten home? Uh, my wife's been a rock star. So uh, I just got back the other day, two days ago, I think. And uh, she's got him on a schedule. Uh, when I left, it was a bit chaotic. You know, we were up every, you know, ranging from hour to three hours. This was a good little stretch. And uh, she's been an absolute rock star through all this. And, and she got him down to pretty much only got to wake him up once or twice. And he can almost sleep through the whole night. Oh, that's um, incredible. Oh, You're it's so been, lucky. <laughs> it's amazing, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to come back to this and, and have him be just just totally in a rhythm with her was uh, it was a surprise, but it was a great surprise. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Shout out to your wife for being fabulous. So, um, uh, yeah, the newborn stuff. I remember three years ago when we went through it. And I'll tell you what, my toddler still doesn't like to sleep. So like, <laughs> just randomly in the middle of the night, she'll walk in the bedroom and be like, I have to pee, dad. And I'm like, great. <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah. Just little tidbits of what you have to come forward into life with as they grow up. But Lake Hartwell, 
second place finish, qualified for the Elite Series. How are you feeling after that? Man, I don't, I don't think it's still um, sunk in. Sunk in, yeah. Um, you know, going into this thing, obviously the goal was to qualify for the elites, but um, you know, I was far enough back to where I could actually win the tournament and not qualify. So, you know, not only did I have to do my job, but I also had to have a few guys kind of slip up a little bit, um, which is just crazy to think because I had two pretty solid finishes coming into it. You know, I think I had a 20, they were both in the 20s. And, and yeah. you know, you would think about two 20, 20th place finishes somewhere around there out of 225 guys in the, in the opens. And, I still have to have those guys slip up a little bit for me to catch them. It's just unbelievable. But, uh, it, you know, things worked out. I, I I feel like I did my job and then, you know, got a little good fortune and, and qualified for the elites, which is still just crazy to me to even say. Um, like just saying it, it, it just, it, you know, it's a childhood dream. Like you said, to, to start the show, it's, a, it's an absolutely a childhood dream. You know, I get to go – fish the tour that i woke up on saturday mornings and got to go watch Uh, you know it's truly a dream come true so it sounds like you're leaning towards going over there you don't have to say either way but it sounds like you're leaning towards the the bass big stage big bass big dreams yeah i'm definitely leaning that way for sure um it, it you know fishing the national professional fishing league. I, I would absolutely love to keep doing that. And, uh, I'm trying to make that happen. Um, you know, going through all the, the, the sponsor outlets and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks after we finish up Kissimmee, I'll, I'll have to make my decision. And, uh, I'm definitely leaning towards the elite series, obviously, if I have to, if I have to choose. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's where everyone wants to be. And and it's credit to like the MPFL has kind of fostered a new generation of anglers that we didn't really know about, which is kind of cool to think about as well, right? Like, so it's a we're not gonna call it like a farm system, but there's a lot of good anglers over there who could make it. And you're one of the first ones to do so. So congrats. Absolutely. Yeah, they uh there there's they're no farm. They're no farm league. I mean, those guys can catch them over there. It, it's it's really impressive. Um, but you know, I owe them I owe them a ton to uh, to just give me the opportunity to fish a national circuit. Um, you know, without having to go through the gauntlet of qualifying through the opens and, and stuff like that. You know, because I tried. Um, excuse me. I tried to do the opens. I did the opens in 2020. I did one region. Yeah, yeah. I did the uh, the centrals that year and uh, didn't do very well. You know, I, I, it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot different. You know, coming from the West Coast, I had to learn not only how to fish these places, but I had to learn how to just travel around and uh, you know where to keep my boat and you know kind of get the uh, rolodex of friends who who are you know basically a lifesaver you know take care of my boat when i'm got to fly back stuff like that you know, it's a whole nother aspect that i had to learn um and it definitely affected my performance uh, in 2020 but we had the opportunity in 2021 to fish the national professional fishing league and you know again there were some growing pains but um to be able to fish a national circuit i had to figure it out you know, I, I, I couldn't drive back and forth every time. It's not, it's just not feasible. Um, you know, my truck would, wouldn't, <laughs> would never even make it. So figuring out, you know, the growing pains of, of how to, uh, how to live on the West coast, but compete on the East coast. That's what they did for me. And then, you know, their schedules were so diverse that it exposed me to a lot of fishing that I wasn't really, uh, accustomed to, you would accustomed say. To. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we don't have ledge fishing, um, back home, you know, if, and we ledge fished at Pickwick, um, you know, we don't have the Northern smallmouth and the Northern largemouth. you know, the way those fish act are totally different. And that's what Winnebago taught me. 
uh, you know, this year we got to go to Erie and uh, fish Sandusky, and I learned how to, you know, I tried to learn how to smallmouth fish, keep up with those guys. Um, you know, they've just exposed me to so many different uh, regions of the country. You know, blueback herring fishing. We fished Lake Hartwell earlier this year in April, and and I learned a lot about blueback herring fish and how they meet, uh, how they act. So I owe I owe a ton to the the MPFL for for really getting me ready for what I had to uh, what I had to go through in the opens. Yeah, that that's awesome, and 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 I don't want to call the farm system because that's not what it is, right? It, mm-hmm. But I love the way they schedule like they lay out their schedule just to the fact that it's like every like six weeks, they usually have a tournament. I think it was right. Like every mm-hmm. four to six weeks. Yeah. So you, it gives you time to figure out how to travel the country, especially coming from Cali to the East coast. But they also fished a ton of diverse fisheries that nobody really ever heard. Like here's about like a right Patman Lake mm-hmm. uh, was it this year. Watts bar was another yep. one you guys went to, right? Like yep. Sandusky is a perennial like open spot or Toyota series where they go a lot, but Saginaw Bay, like it's really cool the way they laid out their schedule. Winnebago just, mm-hmm. I, I find it very interesting and I give them tons of kudos for overcoming all the adversity they did in 2021 to be able to still put out a very reasonable, feasible tour for you guys to fish and make some money doing it. So yeah. shout out to them. Absolutely. But, but let's dive into the real reason, right? Like Lake Hartwell, how did practice set up for you? Did Coming out of practice, did you think you would have a shot at qualifying for the elites and having a second place finish? And kind of walk through the practice and then we'll jump into the tournament days. Yeah. So it actually, um, a lot of th- this tournament really started for me after Sandusky, after the MPFL at Sandusky. Um, I jumped in my truck and I knew I was kind of on a time crunch with the baby coming, but um, I knew I had a, I should have a few days. So I ended up uh, scheduling my fr- flight a few days later than I normally would. And I went and um, I spent three days graphing around Lake Hartwell. And um, for those not familiar with Lake Hartwell, that time of year, um, cane piles and brush piles are going to be a huge player. Cane piles being those big, long, skinny, it's, I guess it's bamboo or sugar cane. You know, they could be 10 to 15 feet tall. And, uh, you know, finding as many of those as I could was was what I wanted to do while I was there. So I wouldn't run out of areas to fish in that tournament. Um, And just real quick before we go forward, I want to talk about like cane piles, right? Like we hear about them on Hartwell and everything that I've read is they're almost impossible to see on side imaging. So you almost have to be run, Mm -hmm. be running down imaging, right? As you're graphing, you almost have to go right over top of them to find them. Yeah, that from what I that's hear. the most that's the most obvious way to find them. Um, so I have a very very short. Um, uh, I, I'm not really well versed in in cane pile fishing, but you know I I, I did what worked for me, and uh, I could I could actually find them on side imaging. Now you have to look very very closely, and the ones you want to find are actually the ones that you're gonna. Uh, find on side imaging because you're going to get uh you want the bushy ones you want the fresh ones that's the ones that uh i ended up catching most of my fish out of you know the older ones that are just the actual like bamboo piece you don't really it's it's just a stick in the water for the most part you know there's no cover to it so finding those fresher ones those um those ones with all the leaves on it was actually the key and those although they are still really hard to see um you actually do get a return of the shadow from you get like the elongated shadow out on one yes. away from the boat yeah so w- the two things i look for uh, you know the shadow and uh if you if i see the shadow then i start actually looking i mean electronics are so crazy these days what we can actually find i actually start looking for the five gallon bucket that mm. um you know they anchor those cane piles with and if i have the the shadow from the leaves and then you know sometimes you can see the sliver of the actual 
I guess we'll call it the trunk. Like the stem um, or the trunk or yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, you see that. And then you see the five gallon bucket down there. That's you can you can still find them on side imaging. Um, you know, it's not like a regular brush pile at all. Um, and I did miss a lot. You know, I, I know I missed a lot because I would go back over with side or down imaging. You know, if I thought I saw something or just if it was a good looking point and I wanted to make sure, you know, sometimes it would take me two or three times to run over it before I did see it. Um, but yeah, you can still find them on, on side imaging. You just got to look really, really close and you got to, it, it was hard because, you know, I'm graphing for 10 to 12 hours a day and, you know, eyes get tired after a little while, but you, if you pay attention and you, you stay with it, you can find them on side imaging pretty well. There has to be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cane piles in that lake. Yeah, between cane piles and brush piles, if you looked at my, if you looked at my Lorances, uh, it's actually if I zoom out far enough, it is just a giant dot. dot. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's a giant dot. I don't know how many I found in those three days, but um, it was probably well over a thousand, if you know, <sighs> at least. And, um, and you're trying to do the lake regionally too, as you're breaking it yes. down, right? So like yeah. you probably have some scattered ones in the southwest corner like northeast corner like where are the best piles where does it line up on contours yeah so i did a little bit of research before just to kind of get a general um idea of where i wanted to spend all my time graphing and for the most part uh, if you're going to be fishing brush and you're going to be fishing cane piles that time of year it's going to go down somewhere on the main lake uh, you know, I'm not going to go run up a river that time of year. If I wanted to run up a river, I'd be largemouth fishing. And that's what those guys that were uh, doing really well the first few days were doing. You know, they were running way up a river. But I knew for me that I wanted to commit to the cane. I wanted to commit to the brush uh, because that's where I, I, I mean, I'm comfortable going up a river and throwing a buzz bait or, you know, throwing a crankbait. But I knew just for longevity, usually those largemouth tend to run out a little bit or they're hard to find relocate so i ended up you know committing to that brush um even you know before the tournament practice even started um just because uh you know graphing around for three days you know i knew i was i needed to commit to it and uh, i knew i needed to have a lot uh which actually ended up helping it, it it played pretty pretty big in the tournament having as many as i did you know, Lake Hartwell, it's a really big lake. It, it does swallow up boats pretty well. But, you know, when I'm brush pile fishing, I like to hit as many as I can in a day. And uh, having that, it wasn't endless, but it was about as endless as it could be. There's no way I could have fished all of them in one day. So having, having that many brush piles actually enabled me to, um, first of all, I can go find the piles where, where I wanted them you know, which was a main lake point with some sort of channel influence. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if I had five, five of my good piles that guys were on, I could just go to number six. You know, I never, I never had to really worry about, you know, I have to be on this pile um, or I have to be here. I have to be there, you know, and then, you know, get disappointed when there's guys covered up, covered up on them. So having that, that many piles was, was really, really key for me. So now my question is, when it comes to the cane piles, how can you tell which ones, besides like the nice leafy green bushes on them, right? How can you tell how many fish are there or like the class of fish are there if you're just scanning? Like, you know, you're, you're graphing around Hartwell and you're pre-practiced for those three days. Mm -hmm. If you mark specific stuff, you're like, there's bigger than average fish here. And I hope they're smallmouth. I mean, not smallmouth spots and largemouth. Um, so in, when I was there pre-practicing, it was just, um, purely just to find as many piles as I could. Um, you know, they get, especially in the good ones, like the leafy ones, they're actually really hard to see. Um, even if you, sometimes if you go over them with, with down imaging, you know, a lot of times actually you'll see them over top of it or you'll see, um, you know, them suspended on the side of it. But um, I would actually shoot my forward facing sonar on a lot of the ones that I wanted to fish. 
And that's how I found for the most part, whether they had fish or they didn't. And, you know, I'm, I'm still not very good at, at determining size, but I have a general idea of, um, you know, how big a fish is, you know, is, is it a 12 incher or is it a, you know, three plus pounder? I can, I can visually see that on my forward facing sonar. So, um, that was how I ended up kind of figuring out which ones were better and, and which ones had fish. You know. And then on top of that, which one, you know, I would actually physically fish them, um, in practice and, uh, you know, you catch one and catch one, catch a three pounder and there's 10 more with it. You know, that, that one's going to get the, we're going to fish that in the tournament. Uh, so running a lot of it and, and physically looking with the live scope and then, uh, actually fishing them and drawing those fish out or catching them gotcha forward facing what a tool that is isn't it oh it's it's changed everything it's changed yeah. absolutely everything now i Ooh. wonder like and this is just me thinking out like the forward facing with a cane pile do you think it in perspective mode would work really well because you then you can kind of pan and see where they are or would they is it better to shoot at the cane pole with just a standard forward. Um, I mean, at least in my um, usage of the perspective mode, it, you know, it doesn't really work for me when the, the water's water deeper. Rate. Yeah, which would that would be the only hindrance I could see doing that. If if you could do that, that would be awesome because there was a lot of fish that uh, you know if you watched live when i was fishing and, and i was physically looking for those fish you know i knew where the pile was but then i was also looking for those those singles and those doubles that were just kind of out by themselves you know so maybe everyone, off the side or something mm -hmm, absolutely yeah maybe they weren't in the pile at that moment that's you know but that's home base but they're out you know chasing around looking for looking for those herring and looking for those those really small shad um, so having, having that forward facing sonar, it, it's, it's, yeah, it changed that whole tournament. There's no way that I catch what I catch without it. Yeah. It's such an incredible tool. I'm happy to have it on my boat. Cause since I got a new boat, the one thing I had to have on it was forward facing. Cause I'm mm -hmm. like, it's going to change totally how I guide, how I fish. And I can already tell you, like, I'm a completely different angler today than I was a month and a half ago. And it's just oh. blowing how much like it has taught me and shown me in like five weeks. Yeah. Well, I mean, before it, we never really, you never got to see, unless it was a top water, you never got to see how that fish reacted to your bait. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, we'll get into that in a little bit with, um, you know, how I got to, to catching them, but uh, how, it, how a fish reacts to, what you present to them. I think that's the biggest thing that, uh, that that forward facing sonar does for you. You know, it really, uh, it can really show you a lot of information if you're, if you're really paying attention on what the fish are doing that day and, and just how they, how they want to feed. Absolutely. So this is where it gets fun, right? Lake Hartwell, you're in that practice. How did you figure out, that they were on a football jig. When people fish spots <laughs> on Lake Hartwell, you think top waters in the fall, especially spots in the fall, like they love top water baits. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of live footage on other tournaments in the southeast in the fall where it's like top water, something bright mm -hmm. groom all day. They're eating shed, chasing blueback herring or a drop shot or something super finessey. And here's Brian Smith whacking them on a football game. So how did you come across that? Yeah, um, man, if I could have, if I could have been the guy that had, you know, that chrome, I, I'd be throwing, you know, I'd, chrome walking bait, uh, you know, like Strike King Sexy Dog or throwing, a, you know, soft jerk bait like the caffeine shad. I would have loved to have been that guy. That's my deal. Um, I love throwing walking baits. Yeah, I can do it all day long because I know the quality of fish they catch. And then I, I know I just have so much confidence in, in doing that all day long. So I was actually, I was 
foaming at the mouth going to going into this tournament because that's I mean that's right up my alley. Um, after a day and a half of um, fishing, the, a couple things had happened. First thing that happened was the lake actually was turning over, oh, and works. yeah, so I think the range that the fish usually have got really cut down because the water got um, pretty green and you know everything's all turned up and they they were just they were just kind of funky you know i would throw i would throw you know a walking bait over them and, and they would follow it out you know and then i would throw uh, you know a caffeine shadow and again you know you get some to bite but uh, it wasn't it wasn't what i was expecting um, I had a lot more fish follow it, which again, this is forward facing sonar showing me, you know, if I didn't get bit, I wouldn't have thought there was a fish on that cane pile, but I could see the seven fish that followed me out. Okay. What does that tell me? It tells me that I'm getting their interest. I know where they're at. I just have to figure out a way to get them to bite. Um, and with all the pressure that the, those fish get, you know, from, Man, once they get out into those piles, I mean, they just get beat on daily. And then you put the 225 guys for our tournament out there. Um, that really, really doesn't help. And then a fall turnover on top of that. Like, we had a lot of things going against us going into this tournament. And I think it's why um, if you if you look at the guys who did really well, either they were up a river um, kind of going for those fish that aren't really affected by pressure and uh, a, a turnover, or you had a lot of guys finesse fishing. Um, and in, in a way, I, I was finesse fishing. You know, I, I wasn't throwing the power fishing baits. You know, I wasn't throwing the, the top water and stuff like that. But um, anyway, getting back to the question. Um, so I had a jig tied on. You know, I doing my research and you know every once in a while uh, a top 10 guy would would do really well on a jig so i had one tied on i had it in the boat and after about a day and a half of just being really frustrated not being able to get these fish to bite i decided well let me start actually fishing in some brush piles so i pulled it out and uh the first brush pile i saw a couple fish over the top of it i throw it in there and it falls straight to the bottom they shoot down and, uh, you know, they really, really reacted in a positive way to it. You know, they followed it down super, super quick. And I popped it one time and I had about a two and three quarter eat it. I was like, okay, that's cool. I finally got one to bite. And this is after throwing the Nico rig and the drop shot and stuff like that, which I really just didn't want to do it. I tried it, uh, but I really just didn't want to do it. And it just didn't seem like. I knew there was a way to cover some water and catch some fish there. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to, to really, really cover some water quickly and not have to shake a worm in their face to get them to bite. So that first one kind of gave me a little confidence. And then I actually, I just started um, panning around with the, the forward facing sonar and um, there happened to be another little pile. It was pretty small, you know, maybe only two foot off the bottom but there was a blob sitting right in the middle of it. So I threw my jig in there and I, I mean, I, it landed on its head It followed it down. I popped it once and I actually physically saw the fish spin around. It kind of went around it would, would be what I think it did. Um, and it smoked it and it was a three and a half. So now I got a bait that I can, uh, you know, at least trigger some bites mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I started running a lot of the stuff that I'd seen fish on, you know, maybe I get a blow up on a top water here or, uh, you know, they kind of, they follow it out, you know, like we were talking about, follow it out of the cane pile or follow it out of the, uh, the brush pile. And I started going back through some of those areas and my best five in the next like three minutes, uh, three hours would have been 17, somewhere around there. Which is a like, crazy bag in the fall. Yeah, I caught them really good. Biggest one was like five and a half, but they were a lot of solid fish. Uh, so that was when I knew I was at least on to something. I finally found a bait that I can actually run around it and, and trigger some of these fish to bite. And to this day, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know what they thought it was. 
excuse me, you know, if you think about it, it's a green pumpkin jig falling from the sky to a fish that's suspended over, you know, over 30 feet of water and 10 feet. Like there's nothing natural about it at all. It makes zero sense in my head, but <laughs> fish. <laughs> maybe it was just something they haven't seen or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it was, it doesn't matter. They ate it. And that's all, that's all I really cared about. The only thing I can think of is like on that brush pile, if they're down on the bottom in that brush pile, you have, I have seen spring tournaments where guys, We'll catch them there on like a mop style football jig. So mm-hmm. I'm, the only thing I can think of is maybe it was very similar to a crawfish bite. Maybe there was some crawfish down there in those brush piles that they would eat it. Yeah, there was. There was definitely, yeah, there was definitely some fish. You know, I would have a couple here and there spit up, you know, spit up some crawdads. Um and then I would have a couple here and there spit up some baby bluegill, which uh, I think both are. Yeah, great green what, pumpkin. Yeah, both both are really, you know, they, they make sense. Um, it still doesn't make sense why they would follow it down from 10 feet to 30 and bite it. But, again, I'm not going to ask questions. Um, Those are just the, fish that didn't read the book. So, exactly. Like, <laughs> which happens 99% of the time. But yeah. We're all it, stuck chasing a book and what it tells us to do and then as soon as we do the exact opposite we catch one half the time. yeah and in, in the book you know i think uh i think the book really um i don't know if it hurt a lot of guys but the book tells you to work a top water over those fish's heads um as fast as you pops- possibly can and throw a jerk bait and throw a soft soft plastic jerk bait at them and, you know and, and move that bait laterally and i think uh you know by the time october comes around they've seen so many things go left to right over their head that uh, you know something that actually falls on their head it triggers them differently you know they haven't seen it i think and uh, the way i was working it after um after they would follow it down was i i it was the only way I can get them to bite in the tournament. Uh, and it was actually kind of weird. Uh, so I was throwing a three quarter ounce jig for the most part, especially in the open water okay. when there was, yeah, I wanted it to fall fast. Um, you know, we do a lot of spotted bass fishing out here uh, on the West coast. We have some really great spotted bass fishing. And the biggest thing in spotted bass fishing is getting that fish's attention. And they're a lot like smallmouth. They're very curious. If you can get their attention, your odds of you catching a, catching that fish go way up. So having it fall quickly, um, I think, really triggered a lot of fish into following it down. And having it fall down was actually a, a, a big key for me, I think, uh, because it didn't go over their head. You know, it didn't go left, right, and they just follow it to the boat and sit under your boat. And now you're frustrated. You just pulled those fish off. Um, I was triggering those fish into following it down. Uh, and then after, after I, they would follow it down, um, I'd almost dead stick it. It was almost a dead stick. I would just slowly, slowly, slowly pull it. And then one out of probably 40 fish that I would uh, throw it on would end up biting it. But if they didn't bite it within, you know, six inches of me dragging it, I, I reeled it out and, uh, on to the next. Uh, That's interesting you say that, though, because in practice, when you figured out the jig deal, you almost were stroking it to get mm-hmm. them to bite it, right? So mm-hmm. they were instantly adapting to what you were doing. They were. Instantly. Yeah, yeah. I think the pressure got to them. You know, the first day I caught I caught a handful on the fall. You know, they would grab it on the fall, and then I caught a, you know, a handful popping it. But for the most part, I had to really slow it down. And then day two, um, it was, re- I mean, it was really cool to actually see it, but their mood changed so much from day one to day two. And I think it was obviously the pressure of the tournament. Everybody's actually fishing the piles now, you know, where in practice you th- go over there, throw up, catch one. Okay, there's fish here, we'll leave. Well, now you're going to lean on them a little bit. You're going to put them in a rotation. You're going to hit them four or five times if it's a good pile. <laughs> so the pressure actually really got to them on day two, I think. And to the point where I could physically see them, uh, they changed the way they 
they followed the bait down. You know, hmm. the first day, if you got it within 10 feet of them on the forward facing sonar, if you got it within to fall within 10 feet of them, they were shooting down as fast as they could to catch up with that thing and grab it, either grab it, follow it down to the bottom, and then you could hop it and catch one. Day two, they were much more lazy about it. You know, I would throw it over there and instead of them keeping up with the trail of the jig, there, there was actually some space in between it. You know, they weren't, they weren't hot on it like they were the first day. And that's where, uh, you know, I changed my, my presentation to once it hit the bottom, I would actually do it really, really slowly and just slow drag. Um, but I still wanted to fish quick. So, you know, paying attention to how they were biting it, it actually enabled me, although I'm not moving it very quick, very far and I'm not moving it very quickly. Um, I could still effectively fish that fish or that pile effect very quickly because I knew, you know, I'm not going to drag it very far. It's if they don't bite it within the first six inches, I'm out. That fish ain't going to bite it. Uh, there's no reason for me to try and talk it into it. You know, I have tried everything, you know, we're on day four of throwing this chick. I've tried absolutely every way to get this fish to bite. And if they don't bite it within the first six inches of the drag, at least to me, they're not going to bite. So yeah. that enabled me to, to be a lot more efficient on the water and fish a lot more spots. Awesome. That's, um, that's gotta be a fun way to crack them too. Like in a pile, it might be over. 30 or 50 foot of water mm. like so let's dive into that right like what is what was your football jig setup for hartwell like i want to dive in rod reel mm -hmm. line jig so i'm assuming it's probably a striking jig and then maybe even your trailer for getting those fish to bite if you don't mind indulging our viewers with that information absolutely um so I guess to start, um, kind of one of the more important things was uh, I got the new Garmin transducer, um, the uh, whatever it is, L LVS thirty four, and that uh, that enabled me to see very clearly out to about one hundred and twenty feet uh, was the range, so I could effectively fish for a fish or fish a pile there was a hundred feet away. Cause I could see, I could actually okay. see. Um, that being said, that actually changed what I usually throw my jig on um, drastically because I knew there was going to be a lot more line involved. There was going to be a lot more space involved with a lot of these fish. So usually I would use a, uh, a Dobbin 734, uh, which is kind of a medium, medium heavy action uh, of rod. And I, I bumped it up. I went to a five power rod, which is borderline heavy, still a jig rod. It was a, a DX 745, but it was something, you know, it was a little longer, seven foot four, and it had a little more power behind it, which, um, you know, if I'm making a hundred foot throw and I, I don't know what, what the math would be on it, but there's definitely more than a hundred feet of line out once that jig hits the bottom and, if that fish eats it out there, I want to be able to drive that hook home. Uh, the jig itself, uh, it was actually a hand pour. I, I, I make all my own football heads. So uh, it's, it's just, it, it's the most standard looking football head you've ever seen. There's nothing fancy about it. Is that um, a do it molds mold that it, you use? Yeah. Do it mold. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, they're, that's the only mold that I, you know I use for everything. I pour my own drop shot weights, uh, shaky heads, all that stuff. A lot of I, I pour a lot of stuff that you tend to go through a lot because we need to. You know, fishing's expensive, so when I can save some money, I'll make it myself. Now, if you don't mind me asking, because there's hundreds of different hooks you can pour that jig with. Are, is there a specific one that you like? Is it like a sixty degree head? Is it a ninety degree head on the hook? Yeah, it's a 90 junkie myself. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's a 90. Um gosh, it's a Gamagatsu. This would be a total guess, but I think it's like a 604 or something. I don't know. Uh, but it's the 90 degree one and it's fairly light wire. Um yeah, the 604 I think is the light wire head. So, yeah. 
I the light wire jig. That's why I mm -hmm. pour all a lot of my swim baits on like a round ball head. I use a six yeah. four in. It's an awesome. Absolutely, hook. absolutely love that hook. Yeah. So it was a it was a ninety degree, and then uh, you know three quarter ounce, like we said before, something that could fall fast. Um, Fifteen pound test. I was actually using uh, Strike King Tor gate Tor grade fluorocarbon. Uh, 15 pound test, you know, I wanted something that, that I could throw in a pile and be really, really confident about it because every once in a while I would, I would, uh, you know, you just gotta kind of let a, let that jig fall into the pile, you know? Yeah. So having and something that comes out, you, yeah, <laughs> hope it comes out with the fish. Uh, so that's why usually if I was in that situation and there weren't fresh piles involved, I'd be throwing it on 12 pound. But, uh, you know, just because there was sometimes some, uh, some wood in between you and the fish, I went with the 15 pound test, um, that longer rod. And then actually uh, one of the things that I really think was key was the trailer. Um, you know, I like a trailer that, especially we talked about, we had to get that fish's attention um, to get that fish to follow it down to the bottom. And so I wanted something with a lot of action um, on the fall. And that Strike King Rage Menace uh, is about the best thing. You know, I use it on swim jigs a lot. I use it on anything that I want a lot of action when the bait is moving. But the cool thing about that bait is uh, it's almost two in one. So I would get a ton of action out of those tails on the way down, uh, draw that fish's attention, draw that fish in, get that fish to start following it. Now, with how slow I was dragging it, it actually kind of, you know, you need some, you need to move that, that menace to get it to, to kind of flare around and, uh, and move those tails. So when it was on the bottom, I, at least in my mind, I thought I was dragging it slow enough to where, there was actually no action. Yeah, just uh, dead kind maybe. Of, kind, of, kind of a dead action. I was going to say, too, uh -huh. as you're dragging, you're probably bumping those sticks in the brush mm -hmm. pile. You probably just get the tiniest little flare. Just a little bit, yeah. And I think that was, uh, uh, you know, at least in my mind, pressured fish. I want the least amount of action possible. You know, it's why a Ned rig is so good for those pressured fish, because it has no action. So, mm -hmm. Um, to have a trailer in that Strike King Rage Menace that falls really, really quick and, and moves a lot of water on the fall and then kind of turns around and kind of deadens up a little bit when I start to drag it really, really slow. I think that was uh, that was a huge key to my success and getting those fish to bite, you know, and um, almost turning it into kind of a Ned Rig jig, if you will, um, to where there's just not a lot of action. And they just look at it, look at it. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll eat it. Or that looks weird, but yummy at the same time. I need good that. enough. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Uh, <laughs> and then I, I actually had a I had a second jig, which was a half ounce jig, um, same trailer and everything. And that would be one if I would see those fish up in the water column. Um, you know, I I fished cane piles and I fished brush piles, but I also fished. They were sunken trees I'm, I'm pretty sure what they do is they cut the tree down off the bank and drag it in the water and it sinks right there uh, but they were full-on full-blown trees and uh so i had a half ounce version same rod same line um same reel uh loose uh pro team um uh, 7.5 to 1 reel and that half ounce one was actually one that I would, if I saw them up high in those trees, I could actually swim it uh, and get, uh, get them to react to it that way. You know, it's not, again, it's not the top water. It's not the, um, you know, soft jerk bait like they usually see. And uh, day two, I actually, the tougher day, um, I caught two, almost three and a half pounders out of the top of a tree swimming that jig set up. And uh, without those, I wouldn't have the elite series berths and I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be fishing the top 10. So a couple key fish like that, just a little change in the setup, but uh, same general idea. Yeah. 
And I wonder if those were like your bluegill eaters at that point too, because I'm assuming yeah. those trees were relatively shallower than the cane poles, and I and I don't know if that's true or not, but that almost seems like swimming that jig. You're almost mimicking like a bluegill action over top of the trees. So yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that's what I was going for at least. Um, whether or not they thought it that way. It doesn't really matter. You know, I got a couple to eat it that way, but that was, that was absolutely what I was going for. Kind of a more bluegill look and uh, just something I could swim through the top, kind of feather it through and have them just a little different look. That's, that's what I always try to do, especially, you know, my whole season on the opens um, with the amount of pressure that those fish get, you always kind of have to find something a little different if you want to succeed. And uh this week was the jig for me. Yeah, I I think I went when I looked at the top ten photos. I was like, okay, that's the same, that's the same, that's the same. And you could tell the guys that chase a largemouth and the guys that caught spots were all throwing the same thing. And I'm like, oh, Brian's got pictures of spots, but he's throwing a football jig. I'm like, this is kind of cool. Like I can't yeah. really talk about this. So kudos to you, man, to figuring out something just a little bit different to get those fish to bite and ultimately reach your childhood dreams and goals but um before we wrap it up here because that was awesome thank you for all that information mm -hmm. first of all but you do have one tournament left on the tmpfl this year mm -hmm. and it's at the kissimmee chain how are you feeling about that event especially after hurricane ian just wreaked all kinds of devastation across florida like have you heard anything about like what even florida looks like at this point um, I really haven't, um, you know, the whole focus over the past month and a half has obviously been the birth of my child in Hartwell. Um, so I haven't, I haven't gotten to do my usual pre-scouting and pre, pre-practice and, and stuff like that for that event. So not that it would have done me much good to be able to, uh, look around before the hurricane hit, because I'm pretty sure a lot of stuff changed before that happened you know with all the flooding it's going to move a lot of that grass around it's going to move a lot of the mats around um i do feel fortunate that i was able to fish it in january and at least know how to get around uh, know what i'm going to generally be looking at in each lake because they do all set up um fairly differently uh, but you know for the most part we're going to be going into this just um you know, just going to try and go fishing. Um, not being able to, to look around, uh, you know, I, I would have loved to have looked around, but uh, after that turn, after the Hartwell tournament, I think I only had one day. So I would have had to shoot down there and shoot back up and then get on a plane. Uh, it was just a little bit much. So we're going to just kind of go fishing like we usually do and try to figure them out on the fly. Um, I think it's going to be a really, really cool event, you know, we talked about, you talked about it earlier, you know, the MPFL, they're not, they're not scared to do stuff differently. You know, um, you know, they hit a home run with Wright Patman last year. That was one of my favorite lakes that we fished last year. And I hadn't heard about it before that. And I think 98% of the people that, uh, you know, followed it, hadn't heard about that lake. And it turns out it's an absolute gem. I'm sure a lot of locals were like, son of a... <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. I mean, I'd love to go oh, back. Uh, that, was, that was definitely a special place. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to Florida in the fall, which you really just don't... Yeah. I don't think we're going to find too much information um, on it, on tournament results, stuff like that. You know, generally Florida, you go there in January to... To, to February, the bigger tournaments at least. So uh, that'll be a fun one to figure out. And, uh, you yeah, know, it's going to be probably a fly by the seat of my pants kind of kind of deal where just go fish what looks good and try to figure them out while, while we can. Yeah, I hope it works out for you because, I mean, I was looking at the AOI standings and you're in the top 10 currently, right? So mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a chance at AOI. You probably need some major slip-ups by the guys leading. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's always a chance it's fishing, especially with the three-day everyone fishes NPFL format. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, 
getting angler of the year that it, it probably it the numbers say i could do it but uh i don't think it'll happen um i'm gonna try to make it happen but again you know that's depending on a lot of people slipping up uh, yeah. but you know if i could move up a few spots i think that'd be pretty awesome and uh you know we got three days to do it so i'm looking forward to it well i wish you a bunch of safe travels back to florida and back west because I think even if you get into the, if you stay in the elite series, you'll probably stay in California. I'm assuming based on already three years in, right, of traveling, mm-hmm. there's probably no leaving out west. No, um, we're we're pretty settled for now. Um, you know, with 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 plane plane tickets and plane rides, it, it's really uh, it's not that bad. You know, it, it's obviously an added added expense and. A little bit of a little bit of a pain sometimes, but man, I got uh, I got a lot of great friends around the country that have you know helped helped me out the past two years. You know, storing my boat, storing my rig for a few days, giving me rides to the airport, picking me up from the airport. Um, without those guys, man, it it doesn't happen for me because that's uh, then I'm paying for storage units and paying for Ubers. I, I mean, the cost would just be ridiculous. So right. having friends. Yeah. Yeah, having friends that that can help me out like that, where they've been absolutely crucial to to making this dream happen and and keeping it going. Yeah, and I know Bailey would say the same. If you ever need anything around Buffalo, New York, just let us know. So I appreciate it. Yeah, anytime, buddy. And um, if we don't talk between now and then, I uh, look forward to seeing you at the Classic again. That'd be awesome. Yeah, March. I'll be so there. We will be there as well. So. Um, But congratulations on everything that you've accomplished this year, especially for qualifying for the Elite Series. That's absolutely awesome. If you end up going there, I do look forward to watching you on live once you get there to see really what Brian Smith is all about besides just talking to you over a computer. But anything (laughs) you want to kind of talk about before we let you get off here and go hang out with your son? No, man, that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, just, uh, really, really thankful for how these last, last, uh, last few months have have worked out for me. I'm truly blessed to be able to do what I do. I couldn't do it without the support of my family, my friends, and, uh, you know, the companies that I work with in the industry and out of, um, it, it takes, it takes an army. It really does to make this, make this happen. You know, it seems like a solo sport and uh, it is to an extent, but without the support system, none of this stuff happens. You know, my wife taking care of the baby and taking care of the house, you know, we got two dogs, two cats, an iguana, a couple other lizards, and now a a new baby boy. So she has her hands full and uh, for me to be able to go out there and not have to worry about everybody's well-being uh it's absolutely uh it's huge for me and uh you know i get to focus on what uh what i need to focus on and you know without her none of this happens yeah like i said before thank you to your wife for uh allowing you to live your lavish lifestyle being a (laughs) professional bass fisherman (laughs) and holding down the fort at home while you are gone so absolutely yeah we all know it's not the most glorious life in the world but it's a fun one so it is it is well thank you yeah thank you for taking the time tonight and uh i will let you get out of here and we will chat soon all right thanks again andrew i always appreciate it yeah we'll talk soon brian have a good night you too bye bye now all right everyone well that is brian smith's story about qualifying for the Bassmaster elite series with the second place finish in the southern opens there at lake hartwell um i truly hope you guys enjoyed this episode as you can tell it was just i again today because bailey is on his hiatus uh traveling around the southeast and midwest and um Make sure you check out the Lure Lab podcast tomorrow when it launches at 6 a.m. Talking Finesse Swim Baits. And we will see everyone next week.